being here. Um, uh, I come from, from Lisbon, I'm currently recently part of the staff of the New University of Lisbon where I teach industrial archaeology. And so when I read uh, um, your, your, your summary for the session about how we understood and are we actually relevant, and you also focused on the idea of the name, what should we call this thing that we do, and actually it, it took me on a sort of a trip <laughs> on the name of industrial archaeology, uh, and, which I think is relevant. Um, so I use this, this is a very British sentence, what's in a name, um, and so if we called it something else, right, industrial archaeology, would it still be the same thing? And what that is, that this sentence is trying to say, say that, that it doesn't matter what we, what we call it, what matters is what we do, the nature of our activity. But actually having a name to call what we do, saying I'm an industrial archaeologist or uh, I work in this field, it helps us connect. So we all know the industrial archaeology session is where people who do, who work with the same timeline that we do, we have some, who have some of the problems and questions that we do, they will join us there. Um, and so one of some of the, of the theories is this, this one, like Professor Patrick Martin is probably now from, uh, was president of TIKI until recently, um, and so we do many different things, right? It's, it's, we are all industrial archaeologists. As you said in the presentation, archaeology is a discipline. We know what to do. We know there an evolution of the practices in the field, and then we apply it uh, to this thing called industrial. And so it says that we, 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 we can, whether styled as historical, post-medieval, or <coughs> industrial, we would all be working you know, around the same subject, and so we should forget about this main discussion. Um, but the discussion about our name is actually the, the basis of our discipline, in a sense. Um, and I found it very surprising, this discussion that we had, uh, um, mostly in the United States, uh, with Pauli and Vogel, this 69, and Pauli was, uh, Vogel was very surprised that industrial archaeology was still in doubt, that people were questioning what it was and if it was relevant, and as if it was, it was supposed to be uh, settled by then, 69. Um, and so, a few years later, in the 1990s, we use this document a lot, uh, at least to say, you know, there's industrial archaeology, uh, is it thematic or theory discipline, are we working with industry, every type of industry, or, or not? Uh, and so it's usually the students love it because they, they, they love this comparison about, you know, we are not studying uh, the lithic industries, we are actually focusing on a certain period of time. But this actually has a, a problem in Portugal, and I know that the reality is a little bit different. Um, that actually, you know, there's there's this time frame, and we weren't as uh, you know here in the UK, the birthplace of industry and the industrial revolution left very strong marks on the landscape. In Portugal, industrialization was a little bit uh, less developed, so the size uh, and the effects on the landscape they are uh, they are slightly different. And so when we talk about industrial archaeology, it's still very not well known, and sometimes it is confused with the time period. So as it would be the same thing as here calling uh, Victorian archaeology to industrial archaeology. In Portugal, sometimes the tendency is to call it contemporary archaeology, because it's the contemporary period. And um, of course, you cannot treat the, the, the early 19th century as contemporary, it's the same thing as 30 years ago, a can of Coke or something. And so this discussion is pertinent at the moment. So um, the name in itself, so settling on a name, um, what it means and how we have been seeing our subject of study has been developing quite, quite largely, of course. Um, it's, uh, it, it's now a very large period of study, so it's not just the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the concept of monument or industrial monument has, of course, been uh, uh, left behind. Right? Monument, uh, aesthetic, a certain symbol we, we now recognize the value of the non-monument, the symbol, the day-to-day activities. Um, and so, and growing on the, through, through, through more recent years, um, this recognition of, uh, there's an archaeological study. Archaeological study doesn't need to be explained uh, very much because what is archaeology, what do we do, right? It's the, the, the methodology. Um, and so, and at the same time, it's a preservation movement. So, as a discipline, we were born uh, um, probably in a, in a different setting than many other disciplines because we were concerned about protecting the sites as well and they're very often uh, above ground and so there's also that contrast with uh, um, excavation archaeology so this is in a sense what we are documenting we have this definition 
we likely uh, are using this reasoning, the Nishita Hill Charter definition for what industrial archaeology is. And so after all these years, like we went back to 69, and we know that industrial archaeology is already being talked about in the late 19th century. So the concept, the idea of studying archaeological uh, industry, studying archaeological uh, the industry uh, is quite old, actually. We have always been struggling with the name. <laughs> and that actually takes a lot of energy if we keep discussing, uh, are we industrial archaeologists? Do I do industrial archaeology or do I do something else? And we move some of the energy uh, um, that we need for more uh, impending uh, um, problems. So one of the ideas is that um, for industrial archaeology to develop is that we actually need to know what this means and, and what, what, it, you know, what are we studying. And you have also mentioned that is it important that uh, the fact that not many uh, universities actually have this field, they're teaching this field at universities. And in Portugal, actually, we are the only um, we are the only university that has a mandatory course on industrial archaeology. So we try to take the students from uh, every period, from the history up until um, you know, the mid mid twentieth century. And we've been finding, um, well, that this is, in a sense, it's very complicated. So this is uh, my, my recent experience with students, is there's a big contrast of being able to dig a site or not. So I mean, they go to archaeology and they're expecting us uh, that in every period, whatever we are working with archaeology, we will go to a site and dig something and actually work a lot with materials, with, with objects. And the reality is actually that we, I have so many sites actually above ground that need immediate care due to, um, you probably realize that Lisbon is being very touristic at the moment, so um, there's a lot of development, new development. And so, as we are saying, industrial heritage, as well as not very well recognized, so there's no, no mandatory um, obligation <laughs> to have an, archaeolo an archaeologist studying this site, doing this research. And so, Many of the sites disappear, and in academia, it's a way to reach them before they get destroyed and actually teach something uh, to the student in these new methodologies, methodologies of um, um, you know, documentation, identification of sites in the city, etc., different type of uh, archaeological work that is not uh, the, the excavation. And so, and we find that it is very important that the students that come out of this university they know that there's a period of study and that there's all these problematics. Um, and that they, they are familiar already with some processes in industrial, in some industrial categories, um, but this is not present in other universities. And so when they go out into the, the, into the work environment, many of the archaeologists on the other universities of the town, of the, of, the, of the country, they don't know what they're working with, and so they just say, this is contemporary, and usually what is very recent is not thoroughly documented. So every time that it is contemporary, we see people that they don't, um, collect objects, they don't take soil samples, um, they usually let you know, foundations or the, the structures actually disappear because they realize it's not modern, they don't identify uh, the type of ceramics, for example, and so it is being constantly disappearing. So another good thing of being in, in academia <laughs> is that we can do some more, uh, um, we can do some research, and this is actually a, a master's thesis that uh, I helped coordinate last year, uh, in which the student went to see, okay, so there has been, you know, we know that Lisbon is an industrial city, so the sites have to have been there at some point, um, but we don't see that in archaeological reports, we don't have the information, we don't see them at conferences or presentations even, um, and so the first step was, uh, this is our national database of archaeological sites and archaeological projects. And so she went to do some research on, okay, let's find which industrial sites are showing up. And we find the problem, again, with the terminology. So uh, this is 2018, <laughs> right? And so we know that the, the field has been developing for many years. And in the 70s, we had already um, an association for industrial archaeology being developed in Portugal, so we can see there are many years of history behind. And when we go for the, 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 the historic, historic period to you know, insert our site in, in this database, there's no industrial period. So we go from the modern period, which also ends around the, the end of the 18th century, and then everything else is contemporary. So 
you know, a top player that we dig that has, I don't know, a, <laughs> a, you know, a beer top or something is as contemporary as something of the early 19th century. And so this creates a problem in documentation and identification. And so she could only find on the database 10 sites. And so, and uh, as everywhere, I think, in the uh, uh, Western world, the 90s were a big period for uh, uh, excavation, so a lot of research happened that time. We had a, a crisis in around 2010, but now recently, again, lots of excavations are happening, happening throughout the town, and so only 10 sites, it was absurd. And so I so, said, okay, I'll contact directly the, the, the archaeology company, so I'll go to contact archaeology and ask them. And many of them said, oh, no, we don't have anything like that, no, we, don't, we haven't worked on anything like of that period, no, no. And then another five sites showed up. And so she ended up on all this research with 15 sites in Lisbon that corresponded, that had evidence of the industrial period. And so our conclusions are that, that the fact that the name of industrial archaeology is not properly uh, explained and that it is not taught at the level of the university and it's not discussed thoroughly in conferences is actually creating a big problem in the identification and documentation of the sites that actually needs to be uh, addressed at some point. So it's a completely different reality I mentioned from what uh, you have here. So, um, again, in the field, right, so we realize that in academia, in a sense, the professionals uh, um, have a hard time identifying what, why we need an industrial archaeologist or what they do. And so what happens when we get to the society when we get to work with the city councils and, uh, and the, actually the private owners of many of the sites that we, we have to document. And so uh, uh, this past summer we have been in this, uh, this is a rice uh, factory, so to, uh, to rice milk, <laughs> so to, to, to work the grain of the rice of the nearby fields. And so we were doing uh, an inventory and documentation of this unit because usually uh, as you may know, many of these sites get vandalized, all the objects get sold for scrap, and so it's very rare for us to have uh, um, the objects in their original place so that we can understand what kind of uh, evidence they actually leave on the site. So it's a, it's a very specific uh, um, uh, setting that allows this to be protected. So, and then we did our, our work with the, with the students, and then we had a few open days. Um, we had a, a tour guide, and we had an open day for the community. And so when we had this open day and we were um, actually expecting that people would teach us, you know, technical issues, like how does the process function inside the factory, you know, where does the rain get in and what does it, this machine do, etc. And they were not interested in that at all. Actually, they were not even interested in actually talking to us, listening to us, explaining the site. All they wanted was to be back in a place that they felt connected with. So this place had been, um, had been closed. Uh, since the early 80s, and so many of them remembered, uh, you know, their parents working there or going there as um, as children visiting the site, etc. And so they just they were crying at the opportunity of returning to a place that had meant so much to them and, and to the community. I'm sure you, you recognize um, many of these tendencies because it was again the center of the community, the, the source of jobs, and it meant a time of more uh, of more activity and more energy in the in, in the entire town and so they were they were missing that so it's a, a, in a sense they didn't really need us to be there they just needed us to open the door and let them back in and let them reconnect with the site of course they were curious to know what we are going to do with it again if we are able to make a museum and make it really accessible but that's a, a different problem um so what how are we seen right i mean we we usually work in this project and mostly development, uh, development projects, where actually, again, as I was saying, there's no, there's no mandatory need for, for a developer to have an industrial archaeologist documenting the site before it makes any transformations to it. Um, and so we have been reaching some places only due to other archaeological sites being protected. And so, I mean, thus part of the industrial building is inside a protection area, and then we actually get to go there and do some documentation and them to have an archaeologist uh, uh, being there. And many times, as you know, uh, I think has already been pointed out here, these sites are very degraded, uh, uh, they're actually dangerous, uh, frequent fires taking place and, and, and other activities. And so when we 
are asked to write something saying this is a very important building and it should be protected and it needs to be documented and it needs to have an archaeologist uh, following uh, whatever happens here, uh, they always think that we are very complicated people because they want to see new things happening. They don't understand the need to document or to you know understand what has been left at this place or uh, a specialized look of uh, um, evidences of use. And so we are usually, again, as many archaeologists, not just industrial archaeologists, we are actually stopping and, and not allowing development. And that's a, a very big issue in Portugal. Recently, uh, um, um, you know, um, a city council official actually made a comment that archaeologists shouldn't be needed when there's an archaeological site coming up on an excavation, which was a little bit absurd. So uh, we, we, we think we're on a certain level, and then we realize that society is not actually uh, um, following <laughs> uh, in our ideas in the same way. Um, and then again, when we were there, this is again that rice, uh, rice, rice mill. Um, are we just professional cleaner? Are we just going in there and sorting out what people have been, you know, piling up in these areas, and then in the end, giving them, you know, nice uh, paper saying you have this object, this object is from this area, and here's a photo, and you know, doing the the, the proper inventory. And in a sense, the answer it, it goes to finding that question of what is our meaning, what are we doing? So it has to be something beyond, beyond documentation and inventory. But again, and I haven't been showing you, uh, um, I haven't, I haven't been showing you images of big sites because at the moment, and for 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 you know, it's a problem I think of ethics. We cannot be planning on opening new sites and being new sites when there's so many factories, so many buildings that actually need, uh, they're full of objects inside, they're full of documents, uh, plants, everything in there, um, and they need to be documented and salvage it. And now we know there, there, every winter that passes by is another <laughs> factory that, that we lose, and so there's, that's a big problem. And actually we're running after development, the developers, especially in Lisbon. And so a lot of things are being lost. And there's not a lot of us <laughs> out there, <laughs> I have to say this, so there's not a lot of uh, people working in this field, unfortunately. And so another um, another thing that happens is that when I go and say, oh, we're industrial archaeologists and you know, we're working with heritage, and you know, people usually don't follow up on the conversation because they realize they're not understanding something. So are these ugly places uh, um, so, so damaged? Uh, are these heritage? I mean, they understand if you say that castle or a church is heritage, but they have a hard time understanding that we are trying, uh, that we are actually dedicated to protect and understand the sites. And so, um, one of the one of the one of the aspects in, in this heritage is actually connected to the idea of new uses. I mean, when we when we visit so this area, for example, you can see on top it's a, it's actually a, um, it's actually a Sherpa model, so it's called the gravity. Um, and below you have an image from Google Maps. So for a four-year difference, I mean, all this uh, vandalism and all this graffiti that shows up in the walls, I and mean, for us, it's actually, it's, it's not vandalism, it's evidence of use. Some, that someone has been doing different things in this area, so something changed here. And um, I remember that um, um, an architect was, uh, that was working with me for the photograph too, and I said, well, if you want, I can, you know, digitally remove all the graffiti so that you can show the building. Like, you know, that's a different thing, you know, let's not go there, we need to show how it is actually today, and then we start uh, going back. So our material culture is sometimes very different, and, and uh, hard to, to grasp for, for that audience, so to understand why do we exist, why are we around these things. Of course, then, it all relates back to the idea of storytelling. So when we start telling people what happened here and how it is connected, the story of the country, right? This is a um, this is for uh, codfish industry, so it's um, actually by the river, and it's one of the first uh, iron iron framed uh, boats was built in this area. And so there's um, children in school in the in the 1940s were being forced to drink cod oil in school. So this is where it comes from, where it came from. So it is, it has stories behind, but looking at it as a site is just an object that we we'll work on. It's um, it's not enough. So. Um, some of the questions that I brought to help, uh, who are not help at all, um, is this idea of uh, the post-industrial society, which is not something that I, uh, that I worked on my thesis as well. Because, so we have, so we have this industrial period and we know that it's over, so that the industrialization took place. 
And so it became this post-industrial society, which is very interesting that it is defined based on what it was before. It's post-industrial. We don't know exactly what it is, so it's post-industrial. So the services, the, the, the <coughs> communications, and some other names that it has been used. But how do we take advantage of what we've been studying about these industrial communities and what about technological development, environmental issues, etc., and actually help the post-industrial community to find direction. <coughs> um, and so this idea of engaging with the change process that we've already been discussing at yeah, time, um, these places are changing, the communities are changing. How can archaeologists move beyond the, what we are taught to do in, in universities, that is document and you know methodologies for documenting inventory and digging, and how can we move beyond and say, now we have to also work on creating change or working with uh, planning policies. How do we even talk to those people? Um, so a little bit is their life after the report, because that's what we do, right? We, we, we work on a site, we finish the report, and then we just end it in and hope that they do something with it. But we, we, we never really verify that they actually understand all the meanings of what we are writing there, the, the, um, the impacts that we are that we are identifying and how do they use it they use the beautiful images and they use our historical uh, aspects and oh this is an old map this is an old picture of the site they use that a lot but what about the conclusions and, the, and, the, and using this for future directions and then again heritage led development because it's heritage that we have can we do something more uh, than just tourism uh, are there other options i think that's an important debate how do we work with these communities? And again, these post-industrial communities, they are, and we'll see in a little bit, but they are in a very complicated situation in many, many, many aspects, like social, economic aspects, environmental aspects, etc. And so how can we participate? So I can resist just bringing you a little bit of this, of this discussion, since this was the, the tag. And so uh, we are doing, we're working with industrial sites, and my, 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 my theory is that we cannot work uh, without thinking of it as, as a landscape, of its connection of the site, the, the, the social impacts, the, the, the environmental dimension, etc. So I wanted to, to try to find out how could we do landscape archaeology uh, um, in post-industrial areas, trying to address the, the sustainable development. And so deindustrialization itself is <coughs> all this uh, uh, degradation of not just the building areas, right, and all this heritage. Uh, that we want to study, but the environment, also the society, drug problems, poverty, uh, lack of work, lack of income, um, arson. I mean, there are plenty of studies regarding this aspect, and it's actually a, a very bad scenario, um, especially in um, in the non-urban centers that have found new tendencies in the service industry. So, well, most of our areas are outside of big cities, and even inside big cities, they have this problem. And so what do we mean by sustainable development? Who defines what development means, right? Can it be can it be UNESCO or United Nations or should it be the community deciding what development is for them? And so again, using landscape, and then I went back to systems theory, uh, which I think archaeology has been like leaving behind <laughs> since the 50s. And so trying to bring it back to see it as a living organism. And so uh, is it like turning places of failure into places of, of opportunity? That was the idea. And so the idea of systems is to understand that the heritage <coughs> is not disconnected from the other elements of these communities, right? So we talk about pillars of sustainable development, uh, society, economy, and environment, and that uh, um, heritage, you know, I would even use heritage more than culture, heritage needs to be also you know, one of the assets that are used uh, and understood uh, in this field. So I'm, I'm happy to talk about this uh, um, more later on if we need to go well. But to, and then sort of being in this position where, where what are the needs of the discipline, right? We need to keep evolving and sensing methodologies and you know, photogrammetries and all this modeling that are, the, that are relevant. Um, we are expanding, we're finding more fields to work on, right? I mean, telecommunications, for example, so many things that need our attention. But then we have these emerg emergencies of material culture itself. I mean, the sites being destroyed, uh, a society that is not understanding that they need to be uh, protected or that they have any value at all, right? So we, we, they are <laughs> under threat and it's our job, uh, I think, maybe to protect it. And then there's these needs of society and communities that actually 
they want to see development, they want to see new sites and new areas, and industrial architecture, industrial archaeology even heritage doesn't necessarily connect to the development that they want to see in the future. So now we need to move from, from opposite sites to partners. Yes, and, um, and so all these uh, demands that are being done uh, to us, industrial archaeologists, they need to be conciliated. And I think that's a big, um, that's a tall order, I think that's, in a sense, again, we shouldn't necessarily be discussing what is industrial archaeology, and I shouldn't have to be worried that people are calling it contemporary archaeology because there is contemporary archaeology, and we also we also know what it is. And so where are we? So we we know what we should be working on. We know the needs, and that should be the emergency <laughs> to be what we should be doing now. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs>